Greetings, 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 good people. Thank you so much for bearing with us as we figured out some stuff on the back end. This is Cat's Corner, the podcast. I'm your host, Mr. Cat O'Kaday, and this is the one-on-one series live where we talk to creatives from all walks of life and talk about how they're managing in this time of COVID. So today we have a really awesome guest who is a, an advocate and sort of a warrior in the food world, in the agricultural world. Um, she has done a lot and she started an amazing organization called Wanda. So we are going to get into all the things that uh, Miss Tambor Way is doing. And I'm going to add her now. Good morning. Good morning, Kat. Thanks for having me. No problem. Thank you for um, being able to make time. I know that you are so, so busy. So I usually start these off with a very loaded question. How are you doing today? <laughs> Well, as soon as this is over, I'm probably back in my bed and getting right. some spare sleep. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. I mean, it's you've been working hard and crazy weather, 80, 90 degree weather. So I totally get it. So um, I thought it would be kind of, right now, I know that there's a lot of conversation around food supply and how uh, the pandemic is affecting that and coming down the, the pike, like when we get into the later part of this year, how we may actually start to see some issues. So I thought it was good to have you on to sort of talk about what you do and then sort of get your thoughts as a sort of an expert in this field about, you know, maybe things that we should be thinking about and managing. So before we get into that, though, I wanted you to tell us a little bit about what you do and why you started Wanda. I thought I read up on it and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. I didn't realize that your, you know, origin stories are fun for me. Like it's, I'm always interested mm-hmm. to see people start things. So share a little bit about yourself and what made you start this initiative. So I always say out of pain comes purpose. And so for me, Wanda really came from two different pathways. One, having my own Uh, children, Ruby and Elliot, and seeing how once Michelle Obama and others came out of office, um, that who was going to continue that really passion for nutrition that was apolitical, um, that recognized the importance that uh, having such a prominent Black figure in food uh, could represent and really be this catalytic converter for so many people to pursue and go back, even create second careers into the field. Um, And then the other part for me was in my pursuit of and passion for health for my own family as a kid, just growing up, not making that connection that our food is our medicine. And when I learned of nutrition as a career, I was already a bio pre-med major at Oklahoma State. And it was through an experience at Texan Children being in an internship that I learned of nutrition was more than just Betty Crocker, um, that it actually is a real science that uh, people study um, that is used in commercial product uh, research like Tropicana orange juice. And I was the only African-American in my program and it was one of those moments where I was cringing in my chair, thinking about all the holiday dishes that my family would have from Chitlin back home in Oklahoma and other delicacies that we enjoyed and having to do calculations on, um, you know, a food calculator basically of like how much fat, calories and everything else that we consume and not even recognize the impact over time on our bodies. And so it became one of those moments that I don't see black people, I don't see women um, in this field and we need to raise up and elevate and create a pipeline um, of inspiring a new generation of food heroes like my daughter to see whether it's even on on just a personal level, making a healthier relationship to food, but also dispelling some of the historical traumas associated with food and ag sectors um, in the black community, um, and then have a platform for those who've already been in it. How do we elevate and give voice um, and highlight their stories uh, through our series, um, through our programs and and document their stories as well. Um, And so for me, the need for Wanda became clear that cross-cut generations, geographies, 
um, of how food is used as a way to create peace and healing in the community and how women can own that power again, that in my opinion, through the women's liberation, we we emancipated ourselves out of the kitchen. And so how to reclaim those spaces again as a sacred healing space um, in a way that is empowering, um, that can uplift, transform our communities and ourselves through food. Okay, so I have so many follow-up questions. So get ready, boo. I know you're tired, but we're gonna get into this. So first question is, can you talk a little bit more about the historical trauma associated with food? I think that is, yeah, I, I, I'm fascinated by that. I mean, I think for me, the best way is just through personal narrative. Uh, as we've seen most recently around uh, just Black Lives Matter and in Juneteenth, you know, people emancipating ancient mama. I would always say she's not my mama growing up uh, because you had this fictitious character that was born out of this concept that really was my ancestor who was taken from Nigeria brought here. Henrietta and being able to understand that she was that mammy figure for a household of 17 children helping to raise in Corsicana, Texas, uh, post-emancipation, she was not emancipated and just acknowledging the unpaid culinary currency that she represented, but it was not rep, rep had the reparations um, in that time period. And so for me, that trauma is also the kitchen rape stories that we don't hear about. I know it's controversial for some, but growing up in Oklahoma for so many generations, not all Native Americans were peace loving. It was also the young African-American slaves too. And understanding mm -hmm. that part of Eastern Oklahoma where we came into, um, that it's, it's, a, it's a sordid history. Um, and for me, it was unpacking all of that, even the concept of soul food. It really is a colonized dish, melding African, European, and Native American cooking methods and traditions and food products together. It's not just mm -hmm. Black people's food. And, and that's what jollof rice is as well. And so many people may not understand going through the literature again, but for me, what it has what I've come to realize in addressing historical trauma is looking at it dead in the face like a demon and, and standing in my own truth and, and punching through that pain in order to realize that's how the release or the test turns into the testimony. Um, and, and that's how in which I honor the spirit of Henrietta and so many others who have been these hidden figures in the food system um, is to rethink that power again because when you think about those who were African women slaves who took shards of glass and put it in the master's dish, I didn't read that in narratives around what food uh, meant. It was always the happy Negro slave kind of narrative. And there were those who struck back on the empire in their own microwaves that we would not discuss or even talk about. And so for me, the education in the school system that is very colonized uh, from a Western lens uh, does not allow the power of how those who have been oppressed have used food in a very um, empowering way. And so through the work of Wanda, we see the need to speak to that level of decolonized lens, not just in swapping our foods back to the original so food of African dishes, but also recognize the need of how we train ourselves, how we understand Black women's food history, what, why that matters to have that intersectional lens, and how does that speak to how we structure a new path and how we see ourselves in this space, um, whether it's now a digital space um, in having these conversations that can catalyze into new careers um, that has not been thought before. Right. Well, thank you for that. That was, that was, that was powerful. Um, especially when we talk about kitchen rape and this idea of uh, resistance being things like, you know, well-ground pieces of glass into the food. Um, I do think that there, I mean, I, it's never occurred to me that there wasn't resistance on all fronts, to, regardless of where you were in the so-called enslavement space as an, as an African or a black person. But um, I do think we don't talk enough about that. And I, I, I thank you for kind of bringing that to light. Um, the other question that, that, the other question that I had resonates around how you associate um, 
women's liberation movements with being freed from the kitchen. And I wonder, when we talk about the kitchen, when we talk about the kitchen space, it's often sort of presented as a woman's space. And I actually have a problem with that. So I wonder where do boys and men fall into the space of, um, of nutrition, of cooking? Like, can it be, can, can, you know, I understand the, the medicine behind food. And I understand that, you know, in terms of whole food diets and things of that nature, that you can, like the diabetes and the heart, you know, the heart disease, all of those things can definitely be cured by food. But I wonder, is it the sole responsibility of women and girls? No, that's an excellent question that I definitely thought about in the creation of Wanda, because, and that's the reason why I created the children's book to kind of have a visual demonstration in the eyes of a child, how do we position men in this space? Um, and so it is reimagining a new narrative and a new image. And it was recognizing that when in my own two children, my son was very health conscious. He easily gravitated to understand food. It was my daughter who had the challenge. And so that's why she became the central character and really inspiration behind the creation of Little Wanda. Because as someone who's had to study maternal child nutrition, no matter how much we would love to have this equal distribution of power in the kitchen um, or just in food in general, the first food comes from breast milk from a mother. And, and we've even had just challenges commercially in the empire striking back on the power of black women feeding their children and how they have been wet nurses for uh, you know, settlers of America. Right. And so right. it's recognizing that that's one part of it, but also the other part is that the role of men and boys is creating opportunities um, that have been opening up doors, which we have countless of examples just in our work about, you know, whether it's, you know, informing us what insurance we should use, what farm we should be working with, uh, opening up the gates into parts of Nigeria. There have been prominent men who played a role in Wanda, and that's been our purpose of understanding just like any Hollywood blockbuster film, who is the main character and who is the supporting role. And for us, it's recognizing that there is this partnership that we all are present, but we understand our different roles. Mm -hmm. um, and in the past, there has been a lot of emphasis because of just living in a patriarchal society, even though I grew up in a matriarchal home, that we have positioned black women at the bottom of the totem pole. And for me, our work is to elevate their prominence that they have played and that they know the prominence they have played and that they can find some comfort in recognizing that you are the queens of beings and he is the king of greens and we can all coexist and come together. But I need you to know that power and I need you to understand that truth and to and be able to exemplify that and not uh, see that everything outside of us is better than us when it comes to liberating our communities and food can equal freedom and how we position ourselves around it. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, so when we think about food as medicine and we think about it as a way to to combat some of these ills, you know, food deserts has been a buzzword that has been used for quite some time to describe what happens, particularly in black neighborhoods where they do not have access to really, you know, to really healthy food. Um, when we think about how expensive organic food is compared to some of the conventional processed things, and we see how poverty plays into what people are choosing to eat and not eat. What are ways that you and Wanda are kind of trying to break through those 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 touch points and get people to kind of re recalibrate how they see food. Well, one um, part of the shift in the in the lexicon just around food and communities have gone from food deserts to mm -hmm. food swamps to food apartheid, mm -hmm. and so it was through the work of Karen Washington out of New York who had um, recognized that we do have food in our communities. I'm here. In, uh, Ward 8, we have the corner stores, we have, um, you know, supermarkets minus the pharmaceutical uh, section, which 
goes into the calculation of how many grocery stores that we have. Um, but the reality is we do have food. It's just unhealthy food it, that creates an obese and genetic environment. Mm-hmm. Um, and therefore, the need is to recognize that it's a larger system, which is why food apartheid has been the better use of word that the system has been designed to create an unhealthy environment for people to self-medicate on toxic um, you know, food and other beverage products, um, such as the liquor stores that proliferate in the communities. So for us is recognizing one, like any proper diagnosis, name it and claim it, claim it in order to actualize what that should look like to resolve the issue. Um, so one education, uh, which is why the Wanda Academy that are, is kicking off this week matters of being able to educate women on understanding um, and getting through and cutting through the headlines that they see in their communities and what they experience and understanding the collective power of sisterhood that can be used to educate ourselves through a decolonized lens of what we see that we're not just, it's like racism, did, did, did he, did I feel, did that happen to me? But then understanding that all these stories come together like, like a class action lawsuit, when you have a collection of stories and you realize that you all are sharing the same story, now just like the power of the words of Fannie Lou Hamer, how does all of us come together like a mighty fist and unite to begin to next second word advocate for a better system because right now you have humanitarian imperialism play out those who say they can speak on behalf of people who have been historically marginalized but and creating a sense of agency, the best people to speak to their issue are those who are experiencing it. If they also are armed with the information of how they are not alone, they have this collective story and there are creative ways in which they can create a sense of self-sufficiency or food sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And then third is the innovate, being able to innovate, creating new black women led food solutions of what can that look like, whether that's owning your own farm or developing your own market um, and being able for us to then celebrate as the fourth of the black women who are doing that work in the community in Ward 7 and 8, to know that you have shining examples. It doesn't have to be Becky and Karen making the solutions for your community. Um, Because in the field of nutrition, we have approximately, they say 2.5% of those African descent who are registered dietitians and nutritionists by the Academy of Nutrition Dietetics out of 89,000 uh, members. That's problematic. When we think about if this is truly a food fight, we don't have enough troops on the ground with the proper equipment to go out and win the war. I come from a military town in Oklahoma. And so for me, that sense of what is the homeland security for the community? What does that look like um, in the human capital investment? And for us, it's saying we not only need to invest in creating healthy food access, we also need to invest in the women and to the people who are behind the food. Um, and therefore, that is involving in the education of them. Um, there should be loan repayment programs to pursue careers in nutrition and dietetics. Um, and the food system itself. Um, So that's why there has been a whole focus around culinary reparations because in the bringing of African in captive people to America, it was agriculture, one of the chief mainstays that really set it off in terms of the tobacco farms of Maryland and Virginia. When you think of Marlboro Man, I mean, that is where Upper Marlboro, Maryland, the the naming of that, area has come from, so many Blacks had to work these fields. And now how are they reclaiming that land with the Black land loss issue that we continue to face every year and understanding that there are ag lawyers as another career opportunity that works to advocate for these farmers. And so it's all a part of this connection of farm to health um, from those who grow the food to those who make recommendations of what kind of food you should eat. Um, we need to have black women along that pipeline and everyone can advocate for themselves, but I really take on a Harriet Tubman mindset of recognizing that I have a focus of who I serve and I can only do my part 
and everyone else get in your lane and you do yours because I'm doing what I came here to do on this earth. Yes, you are. Oh my goodness. I love it. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what growing up in Oklahoma was like and how it continued? Because it, you have mentioned it a couple of times and, I, and I'd love to know a little bit more about how that um, upbringing and being that because you know, Oklahoma, I'm assuming you, did you all have a farm growing up or no? My, my, per, my immediate family, we did not, but my other family members still do to this day. It's a complicated history, but I can dive into it, but yeah. Okay. Well, talk us through, you know, those, those transformative years, the coming of age yeah. and what it's like to be in Oklahoma and to have a sense that something, because I have a sense that you had a sense something wasn't right, but you may not have been able to figure out you know, because the histories are mixed in all of these things and yeah. you've done all this research. But in those early years, like as you are watching things progress, what do you see, you know, in that teenage self, you know, the early 20s self? Well, first, it was only my and my mom's generation were the first to actually like be born and raised in the city. Prior to that, everyone was in the country and you follow Rentiesville, all these different towns that were either majority or small black historic towns right. Um, right. that John Hope Franklin came out of, people wrote about. And part of that was Jim Crow policies that pushed a lot of black families who had farms into the city because of just angry white people who did not want to acknowledge the self-sufficiency of, of communities like Bowley, Oklahoma, that my grandfather grew out of. Um, and so we had a make do even in this uh, next wave of post reconstruction around how do you survive not only World War One and Two, you had the Spanish flu happening and you had the Great Depression happening with soldiers coming back from war um, in the, those early parts of the 1900s. And a new state of 1907 is when the uh, state of Oklahoma began. So it was a complicated history that I did not know until much later in life. And so as growing up as a child there, my only orientation was living in Dallas, living in Oklahoma City, um, being with my grandparents, you know, going to farmer's markets, snapping green beans with my grandma, going to the local dairy store. Um, she loved ice cream. She had diabetes, died from complications of it. And for me, her death seen her lose 11 pounds in the hospital, you know, having uh, a, a, a dynamic back home, I call it the four F's, faith, food, family, and football, that there's this fatalistic view that if I'm a die of something, I'm a die fat and happy. And there's nothing happy about diabetes, um, dying from those complications. And that really struck a nerve with me about reassessing what I wanted to do with my life. I loved art, I loved writing. I thought I would just write books as a kid um, and be an artist, but I didn't see a way. I didn't see, I didn't want to be a starving artist and I would just see commercials that spoke about starving artists there. I'm like, I don't want to be that person. So I was like, um, I'm smart enough to figure science out. Maybe that's the path I need to pursue since there's money there. So I follow the rabbit trail where the money went. Mm -hmm. And I end up, you know, really being passionate about environmental issues, even though I lived in the city. Again, there's air quotes what city looks like in Oklahoma versus city here in DC. Right. Um, right. And so city uh, in Midwest city where I grew up most of my life, you know, city is going to school, but you still have active farms, cows, animals <laughs> across the street. Um, and a, and if you go just a few more miles down, it's nothing but pastures. Right. Um, right. But you can hit the highway in 11 minutes and you can be in the capital of Oklahoma City. So it's all relative around that. So for me, I oh. knew where food comes from. I go to farms um, and it was understanding that um, I did not always want to own that because just like any kid influenced by media, I didn't see my life reflected the closest of be Dallas, this TV okay. show. Um, so it was recognizing that I wanted to leave all of that behind. And it was really over time with my dad's um, passing and reconnecting to family I never knew um, who still were active cowboys raising livestock having hundreds of acres of farm that I had no clue about because again, a lot of that sometimes either goes to the men. There were some women like my great aunt who just recently passed who had the land. She had, uh, had um, 
oil discovered on her land and she lived that that dream that many people think and wish and hope about. Um, but it's been really into my adulthood relearning that family history of mine and making these connections and pulling the records and really being that adult in our family reunions, taking in the information um, and being appreciative and saying like, not everybody's story was Alex Haley. It was just not everybody was on a plantation. Um, and I think that's why I'm so advocating of people to know your own personal story, interview your family members, don't let secrets die with people. Um, and, and that is the richest gift you can give is the power of knowledge of self and your family and that generational trauma, like working to heal that. And for me, that's following the rabbit hole around food and how is my family positioned around that over time and how do I pass that on to my own children? You know, you said something about the, um because I have friends right now who have parents who are not well, who have blood issues, blood pressure issues, who have diabetes issues, who will not change their diet, who will not, you know, you know, I put tea blends together, like, okay, give your dad this tea and, you know, let's try this. And, you know, for a while, di you know, was things were great. And then they just say, you know what? I don't want to be bothered anymore. And I wonder is, you know, I sometimes wonder, because it's it's hard to watch when you know that there are ways that you could live better. Like, thankfully, my father, once I started, you know, delving into herbalism, my father has been super open about all of it and is like done his own research. He's a big fan of Dr. Sebi. You know, he's, you know, he's very healthy for his 75 years. He's, he's done quite, and he's actually, it's funny. I remember as a kid, he came out, you know, we're Nigerian. He came out into the living room. We were all there. My mother was there and he just announced, I'm going to be a vegetarian. And my mother laughed at him. And we all laughed at him because we were like, come on, dad, that, that can't be serious. And this was like in the late 80s. And he just made this announcement. He's He'd always been interested in it. And I kind of wish we'd had a better support system because who knows what, you know, things would have looked like. Um, and I wonder sometimes if part of that, I don't want to, I want to just be fat and happy is because of how much the sheer amount of nonsense black people have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So if ice cream gives you joy, you eat that ice cream because you know what, last week somebody called you a nigger and you had to, and you couldn't punch him in the mouth the way you wanted to. And so what I, <laughs> cause sometimes, yeah, it's real. and so I wonder if the way that, you know, particularly the black community, the processed and the unhealthy foods, the way that they're consumed is, a weird ass way of just putting a little bomb on the wounds. Most yeah. definitely. I literally um, was just having this conversation in the last 24 hours and understanding that that's why we talk about the self-medication, whether that's drugs, alcohol, smoking, food, of all the things as black people in the Western empire, what do we have in our control? And what we do have control over has already been preset, just like a game. Right. And for right. me, it's recognizing that that's why once my dad died in 07, mm -hmm. like I went into yoga, yoga had me reconnect to my body. I started to rethink going back into food and a, no, a whole new lens, not from a book smart aspect, mm -hmm. but really from a spiritual aspect. and finding mentors to understand the power of like food and spirit and food and mood issues and how does the emotions that we um, feel in our bodies end up speaking to how we um, answer that or how does food reflect that. And so um, a couple of books, one was David Hawkins, a psychiatrist, power versus force, like really was an influencer on me. He analyzed, interviewed leaders around the world and really had an understanding about, you know, if Gandhi represented love, and I know he's a controversial figure now that we learned that history, but you had guilt and shame at this bottom of this energy spectrum. It's like, where do you fall um, along that and how does your food become reflective? And so I began realizing that everything, number one, you learn in physics is energy. And so the energy that we feel if we're not operating at a high vibrational level, um, 
how and and if dark green leafy vegetables and fresh raw foods represented this high vibrational level, then what do we tend to consume at a low vibrational energy is things that we call back home fried, dyed, and laid to the side. So right. the fried right. chicken, the french fries, the burgers, anything down, even the vegetables are fried and dyed. <laughs> fried, fried right. okra. And we never make the connection that, oh, just because I'm having the produce, but it's the preparation, like the transfiguration of Jesus, like that process matters just as much as the final product. Right. And sometimes that can get lost in the sauce when you're just focusing on uh, calories or only on, you know, fat, carbs and protein. But it's really understand that culinary aspect um, is critically important. And so that's where I became really cognizant of what is the emotional state that we're living in? How are we emotionally um, as a community right now with Black Lives Matter? Like, I'm sure if we thought COVID, which there's a lot of research around consumer psychology when we're going through disasters and crisis, that there is a higher level of alcohol consumption, mm -hmm. comfort consumption because it's a way to just mitigate and it's what we have control over. Right. But at the same time, the quarantine 15 that we've gained in this process, um, how are we going to like lose that again? Because right. we recognize that we need to be able to create more healthy self-medicating habits. And that's where the self-care comes into and why this academy is going to be speaking to these issues about what are the power of sisterhood when we want to like fall off the horse? How can the sister be your keeper and encourage you and comfort you and pick you back up and just reposition the concept of food of, of what I've learned. I no longer get into the conversation about vitamins and minerals. Like everybody knows it logically. We have two sides of the brain left and right. And in recognizing one understands the ration rationale and the other understands like intuitively what we should be doing. And I've come to this position of, because of the power of colonization and, and there is this link around food colonialism that we have, the tactics have been extracting, mm -hmm. um, erasing, exploiting, um, and because of that, we have sometimes internalized this devaluation of our own lives. And we see that in the violence that are interrupts in our communities. And so if we have a devaluation of ourselves, then we don't really care sometimes what we're eating because I'm living in this moment. I'm not living for a legacy mindset because I don't know if tomorrow is promised. So I have to live for today. And right. so we sometimes have proverbs that reinforce this notion in a logical sense that we are to carpe diem seize the day, but we also should be thinking how are we passing down wisdom for our future generation if we don't have riches to pass down. And it's hard when you don't have riches or wisdom. That means we leave a void in place that people have to literally pick up the pieces and find their own way. And that's not how we build lasting, sustaining black communities that thrive. We're still operating in a survival mode and the food becomes a representative of that emotional state that we are collectively in mm -hmm. that I want to acknowledge that that's the work that we see that needs to be um, addressed as just one metaphor to the life we live. Right. So when we take the term like soul food and the food that's associated with it, because what I hear you saying is that part of what, what we need to do is we need to decolonize mm -hmm. our food and we need to decolonize how we taste things. Um, there's like, so sugar from, uh, from an economic standpoint, once uh, sugar becomes available sort of in Europe in the way that it's because of the transatlantic slave trade, Mm -hmm. The want and desire for sugar becomes so large that the way the in, the, the way that in, the enslaved Africans are are now even more disposable becomes bigger. And when you look at the sugar trade in particular, because up until that point the access like I've even like you know learned about how the, the way we eat fruit and the and what fruit tastes like now wasn't the way it tasted before and how when we start splicing and messing around with things increasing that sugar content has been a big part of what we see with some of the fruits that we consume now but before sugar was not actively 
available in, 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 in sort of a surplus. And it really is one of those industries along with tobacco and rice that really drives um, the slave trade. And so I wonder when you're thinking about decolonizing, um, I tend to see soul food as a means of a ritual um, because of the preparation that comes into it. I know the transformation of the food is problematic because you know the greens are, are fried and boiled to within an inch of their lives. And so they're not even green anymore. But um, I wonder how do you decolonize the idea of soul food and um, and sort of re reshape how we think about the ritual of the preparation? So, <clears throat> so I'll ign um, hit on two points. Um, first, even in the field of nutrition, these are conversations that are not had because this is an area that would be called food studies. Mm -hmm. Nutrition really came from a based off the biomedical model, um, like a, a, a linchpin to med allopathic medicine, not even all medicine. And so it was really in the time of war, like how do we feed the troops who are right. going through surgery? And so with that context, there was a lot of self-study to even know that. So I, in, interestingly enough, because of diabetes in the community and and having you know family members face that, I dived more into sugar in particular and how um, really our people were impacted. And yes, in the Caribbean in particular, uh, because of Spain having really a lockdown on the Caribbean, you had um, this idea that lives were replaceable. If you died in the fields, we don't care. So there's just, it's like blood sugar is the best way to call it. Um, and now we have uh, fast forward was the divestment of sugar in in support of the ending of slavery that was happening, which is why you had those like in New England using dark brown sugar versus those in the South uh, using the white sugar. The dark brown was much cheaper because it was less processed. But when Wilberforce in the UK parliamentarian uh, parliament was like, we need to divert, divest, and which is how the song Amazing Grace came about. Um, it was recognizing that that was their way in which to boycotting a system. Now we fast forward to sugar where we have moved from not only cane sugar to beet sugar, corn sugar, um, that is now made out of a lab, finding ways to replace the culinary currency of black people. Right. And right. now we're still dying of the very sugar that our ancestors were dying in the fields from. Mm. To me, like that's the bigger piece of the story of sugar that makes it even more complicated and, and just intertwined in the black story. Um, and so to the other part of your question, what is the response to that when it comes to soul food? Well, soul food is a colonized genre of food, first of all. And so because of that, um, that is one of the reasons why that light bulb moment for me came back. Well, what is the original soul food? That would be going back to African food. Mm -hmm. And that would be even acknowledging the col colonial colonial impact on the continent when the British Empire came to Nigeria and Ghana and so many other places that they were looking for new market expansions because they needed to feed their people in the UK and they needed to sell their manufactured products. And so they wanted to be able to do that on the continent. Um, and therefore they also began creating their own colonized products. So. For me, it was always going back, well, what was the pre-colonial foods of our time? What were the dishes um, that were created? Why for, for Denono, as many know in the Fulani culture, was a signature just food product that you're greeted with when you're coming back to the Ruga of the village. And so for me, it was understanding things like millet, a strong, food um, for strong people growing in a very arid conditions, tough conditions, something that we as black people know very well what it means to thrive in tough conditions. Mm -hmm. How do we begin acknowledging um, these heritage foods that have been um, out of the really conversation around food in America, in our classrooms, in our in our in our books that we teach um, future 
nutritionists and scientists? Um, why is there no uh, research agenda that invests in the study of African heritage foods that our taxpayers um, pay for in addressing health disparities? Because NIH USDA agenda has invested in uh, studying Inuit uh, foods, mm -hmm. like the population size of Inuit, really not that big compared to like African American. Um, Latin foods have been analyzed. Afri uh, Asian foods have been analyzed. Um, and so when we stay stuck in not wanting to acknowledge the role that food has played in black people's lives and we paint it in a monolithic way, we do not, we, we divorce our ideas of this opportunity to say, if we're really trying to look at some cross cutting solutions of addressing diabetes and heart disease and cancer and all these other issues, it's not just Mediterranean diet as a solution, but even with that, there is a knowledge or lack of acknowledgement that Africa is part of the Mediterranean Sea. And so this is what the co-opting um, when it comes to food by white supremacy looks like. And because we have stayed away from the field to analyze what has happened since slavery, this is where we are now of literally dying by the very fork that we had to support for others to eat and thrive. And I want us to acknowledge that history that has been lost and how we have to reclaim that history. We must create new policies. We must create new businesses that is really in the face of the uh, of colonialism. And it is a form of resistance and seeing it as that. Um, I think we have not chosen to see it as that for so long, but I think what gives me hope and promise um, that that will change is the hair movement has been a great example of decolonizing our hair by releasing from the perm and the relaxer to acknowledge our natural hair and saying that our, our blackness is good enough. And it really speaks to what colonialism really represents um, is about the taming of the savage is what the literature speaks of. Right. Um, and what I mean by that is acknowledging and why um, I wrote a piece last semester around Jamie Oliver and just revisiting uh, what had happened when he really tried to make his version of Ghanaian jollof rice um, and how the response to um, African food bloggers, mostly women, mostly out of Nigeria, they clearly were not being called to that conversation, but they interjected themselves in defense of uh, Jellof and in the defense of West Africa. And it was powerful because it was like, why was this such an issue? As an academic, what would you look at this issue and understand? And what I understood was by him replacing some of the ingredients in the dish with European ingredients, he was taming the savage and civilizing this jollof, which was what I was not seeing in the conversation had because we were not, we were defending it in the lens in which we saw fit. But if we actually go back to the literature and understand the deeper meaning behind it, that is what what he as a, as a culinary platform and power and leveraging his privilege represented on a deeper level. Mm -hmm. And that's what I recognize that we are facing and dealing with. We're dealing with power platforms and privilege that we may not always have access to that's been denied, that we need to reclaim and recognize the roots of where that exists and comes from and why this work matters. And that leads me to, um the question around the Wanda Academy. You have this new, uh, this kicking off, what, tomorrow? This week, yeah. Yeah, it's kicking off tomorrow, um, the Shiro Fellowship. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I was really fascinated by, and I kind of wish I had known about it sooner. I should have applied. Yeah, so we were incubated in Sibley Memorial Hospital um, through the Ward um, Infinity Program, and it was an opportunity to um, pick four organizations east of the river to be able to address some of the community health issues. And so in that six-month period, we had the opportunity to use human-centered design principles from folks from IDEO, from Hopkins, to be able to go in our communities, talk to women at the Anacostia River Fest and at other um, events and just online and doing in-depth interviews and really understanding what are their needs, what are their wants and desires and how, if we could do a for us, by us model, what would that look like? And 
really creating our own black food school online. Mm -hmm. um, and it was an opportunity uh, for us when uh, DC Department of Healthcare Finance um, offered a competitive grant to address the social determinants of health, um, how uh, food, um, the need to, especially, and it was just so timely, like who would have predicted COVID? But right. we had already been thinking, how do we use technology to address health and food literacy? And so literally at the peak of COVID, uh, we had applied and within a matter of few months, we learned that we had won it and, um, and it was only two organizations um, that were selected east of the river. And it was to me a powerful opportunity to be able to design the very platform at a time that makes it even more relevant mm -hmm. that everyday women, whether you're a mama, auntie, nana, um, or a little Wanda, that you are a food shero that we need. Leadership is not just at the presidential level. It is at all levels of society. And Black women have held it down, have shown their leadership for so long and being these powerful forces in our communities, these cultural keepers in our communities. And food is culture, it's identity, it builds community. Um, and so we really wanted to design a Black woman focused uh, curriculum um, around food, um, around self-care, um, and really look at how do we create not only a sisterhood of self-care and service, but how do we create um, an end product like a community cookbook that we co-create together by remixing our own family recipes. How many people are documenting their family through food right now? Right. Or and, and it was powerful for me, why, why cookbooks? Because again, um, as I've come to study the history of cookbooks, they have been a powerful archive and almost like an archeological digging project of being able to unearth and see at that time of our lives in the midst of COVID, how has food and cooking be used as tools to help navigate during chronic disease epidemics, as well as a pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and so the science part of me is looking forward to this idea of how do we not only reshift how we see food and restore our health and reclaim um, our food ways and return to our roots, but also how do we pass this documented legacy to future generations um, within our own families as keepsake books um, that can help tell the story of that not only is the nutrition, the food is our medicine, our narrative is our medicine. And so that's where we're coming together of doing this Heal My Meal Challenge, um, giving these fellowships away. We've been able to surpass the number of um, slots that we had originally. Um, so you held really had 50 slots, right? 50 slots, and we had more than 50 people apply. And so it will be now, or, bringing it into those who fit the criteria, which is um, part of the, the grant mandate is that we support majority of those uh, east of the river because of um, the, the very well-documented health disparities here. Um, and for those who are on Medicaid, we do look forward to having future programs that are open to all, but for now uh, we want to be able to demonstrate how can we impact our communities um, east of the river. And for me, as someone who went to Tufts at the time, our program was number one in community health by U.S. News. How many people can say I'm actually doing what I went to school for? And so this is why it really is a coming home moment for me um, of that I have came here to D.C. originally working for federal government, local government, university, nonprofits. But now, you know, I came to Anacostia after Katrina happened. I had a mentee who lived in Anacostia and she represented kind of like a diamond in the rough. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time I began to be able to like go, dispel some of the myths and stereotypes of a black community. I didn't necessarily live in an urban black community in Oklahoma. And so Katrina for me opened up and was like a, a canary in the mind message of what happens when we give up on our communities and we let the most vulnerable be exposed and walking down 
uh, to the King Center in Atlanta and understanding what it meant to be in that time with Dr. King and that community being mixed income and everyone supporting one another. And again, I guess I have the uh, reminiscence of Black uh, Wall Street of Bowley, my family and how they grew up. And it was just like, no, we, we have left people exposed and to be preyed upon. And we have to recognize that we play a role in being our brothers and sisters keeper. And so that's what I see um, as a term that has been used, urban pioneers for those who have come back to uh, east of the river. But we have an obligation for those who've had a, a time and an ability to learn, just like those who are from the continent who get trained in America, there's an obligation to go back and help. That's exactly how I see um, East of the River as my own little Africa. And how do we make an impact in our communities? Now, it's interesting, this is a great segue. The, the last part of our conversation, I wanted you to talk about that connection. You are of Fulani descent. And so um, the continent plays a very big role in how you um, articulate your message. And I wanted to know what you know it's interesting because when you go so when i go to lagos when i've been to abeklita you know when i go outside of lagos um there's less of the processed food um there's there's more of the more there's you know organic in the sense of you know it's not it's not fully processed i mean plantain chips taste so much different in lagos than they do here like i would never eat plantain chips here but when i'm in lagos i eat plantain chips because they just taste better they taste like real bananas um and so i wonder but I also see like Lagos being a multi, you know, a cosmopolitan city, how sort of that colonial presence of, you know, European ways and ideas are infiltrating the food system. Um, that is very different when you get outside of it. So I wonder how, how has the, in the, in the areas of the continent that you have traveled to and the places that you have worked, what has been the reception around your mission and what Wanda's trying to do? Well, I, I love talking in taglines. And so one of the, <laughs> One of the taglines for me that was that was very prominent uh, to capture uh, what I experienced was the West is not better than the rest of us, mm -hmm. and that was a message that I would reinforce. Um, and I would say that because you know on just traveling, you know, on the road to Kano, you have for just a few naira like your bag of tiger nuts. Yeah. And yeah. but here it's a superfood. <laughs> and it's organic and it's gluten free and all these things and very well packaged. And so it's understanding our Wanda message is all I need is already within. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that means within my culture, within my food ways, within me, um, within my community, and how the impact of colonization has played uh, a mind game on us um, to believe that uh, what is West is better than the rest of us. And that is false narrative that has to be rechanged and challenged, um, training journalists to understand that, uh, training the youth to understand that, um, because those who are in the boarding schools in particular in the private schools, they are going to be the future leaders of that country who will be making deals and policies that will either be a, another extension of neocolonialism um, or those that recognize their value internally and will create products internally in the organization in, in the country um, that really is one that speaks to African pride. Right. And that's pretty much where I am in all of this, is that all this work is really about reinforcing the pride that we should have in ourselves mm -hmm. and really continuing the journey and the fight of our ancestors. Um, and as Doc, as Frederick Douglass, who is literally Cedar uh, Hills around the corner for me, um, he would end with agitate, agitate, agitate. And that's what, to me, we emancipate our foods by first emancipating our minds. Mm -hmm. And for me, reclaiming Juneteenth is about making that strong linkage between food and freedom. Every time we have a celebration, is it one that is healing us or killing us? If it's a birthday, if it's a home going, um, we have to rethink these moments when we say, we just want to, uh, or back home, like, Tim, just let me be happy and just eat this fried chicken. <laughs> 
shouldn't care about you more than you care about yourself. So that's where this really boils down to if we were to keep it really real. Like I don't smoke, I don't drink. I'm proud of that. And it's not for religious purposes because I care about myself. So wait, you care about are you, you? Are you the cousin that everybody avoids when it's time to <laughs> like here, here she come, hide everything. She's gonna knock it out of her hands. Oh, when I see the white buns. Oh. <laughs> If it's white, it ain't right. If it's brown, let it stick around. <laughs> I am that one. Oh my God. I love it. I can imagine, like, y'all better hide them one. Tam is coming. I can totally see it. I don't like to be the food police. Police has gotten a bad rap. I do have some of the family, but I'm like, I'm going to need you to love yourself as much as I love you today. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I can dig it. I can totally dig it. When you think about, I mean, I don't, I think I've known you maybe four or five years. And so, and I've watched you advocate and agitate and like teach and educate. And it's really powerful to see. Um, and I think that what we're seeing, the beauty, I think the beauty of COVID is that you can't, well, you're not supposed to go anywhere. Some of us aren't listening, but in those early days of the, um, of the, of the lockdown, people were, had no choice but to cook. They had no choice but to sort of reconnect. And so I do, I mean, do you feel hopeful um, with sort of, you know, because the timing of COVID, this grant, yeah. this fellowship, like how do you, how are you feeling about, you know, where you see things in the next couple of months? Well, um, like my grandma Ruby, who is still living, she's a spiritual woman who's lived past husbands, my own father mm -hmm. um, and others and spirit keeps her grounded and, you know, it's a, it's a let low, let God, let go, let give it up to God moment. And for me, it was a moment of just reinforcement that I'm on my purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, just like Ecclesiastes, you know, there's a season, there's a lifetime, there's a moment for everything. And I'm in that season of harvest in many ways. Um, early the seeds have been planted right. um and so and we're still we will be technically still sowing the seeds in these women and so the real harvest will come um after the program and being able to see what do we reap um from what we sow and i think um i'm just i'm happy to be in this moment i i look forward to um, just experiencing all the vision that I had for Wanda being really fulfilled um, in the work, being able to take them um, and have these ex these these moments of sisterhood around food in a way that I have not fully seen um, in an organization. And just to me, it speaks to the importance of owning our own truth, our own unvarnished truth. Um, Becky couldn't do what we do, boo. I mean, it's just, it's acknowledging that we have a value. And when we acknowledge that uh, that identity within us, that we can unlock our full potential. Mm -hmm. um, and in the field of nutrition, it's so whitewashed, it's so colonized um, that even those who are in the field um, who are blacks, we have to acknowledge that we have to emancipate ourselves mm -hmm. because we mm -hmm. went through a whitewashing. And right. it took right. me some years um, and I was called hippie granola. I later learned <laughs> when I would write, when I would write, you know, case studies and presentations around Native American and African traditions around food in my class. Um, and it was just acknowledging, well, this is, you know, when I decided to go back to study nutrition and dietetics, it was going back to studying it on my own terms. And it was not about studying it on a force fed way that was given to me. And there is some power in having that sense of confidence of, of being grounded in this is, I know what I'm here for, but right. I had to right. go through my own personal development and transformation and moving from my false self to my true self. And that's where this work of Wanda really comes from that I finally owned everything that I feared, everything that I did not want to acknowledge. I did not want to own my history of agriculture. I did not want to own being from the South. I did not want to own being 
what a woman is because I saw us just being assaulted and erased and devastated that I began to internalize this lack of devaluation in my own voice. Mm -hmm. And it was for me, in order for me to grow, I had to go through all of that and say, everything that I have denounced, I'm going to honor and it will be Wanda. Mm -hmm. and that's where we are right now. It's Wanda is reflection of everything that I said no to, that I began to say yes, because it is me, it is my identity whether I denied it or not. And I hope that is an, a message that many can resonate, whatever field you go into. My path was owning food because I denied that part of the deeper meaning of what food represented and that it has a deeper connection to culture and political identity um, and economic empowerment. Um, but it may be something else for someone and it's okay. All of us can be in our lanes, build into the collective vision and honor our own truths and do it with grace and humanity that have been denied to us for so long. Woo! You may have been tired, but girl, I'm awake. You are amazing. Thank you so much. Well, for we got Woke with Wanda today. <laughs> <laughs> woke with Wanda. That should be a series. I think it's, man, you taught, you, you educated today, and I really, really appreciate that. Like, there. It's a lot of power in the words that you delivered. So thank you for that. Cause I know that you've been doing some really heavy work out in the actual field. And so I, I completely am honored and humbled that you could gather up the energy and do what you just did. Cause it was powerful. Um, I usually end the show by asking um, guests uh, this question. We got a beginning and an end. When we can get back into it, whatever that way looks like now, What's the first thing you're gonna do? <laughs> I'm buying a plane ticket and I'm getting out of here. <laughs> I'll be right I'm supposed to be in Zambia in August, you know, for African Nutrition Society. I'm on the board. And to be at Victoria Falls and uh so it was one of those moments like I I need I need a fly, I need to go. I gotta go. Yeah. I mean, this whole country is on lockdown quarantine. I yeah. guess to be free. Yeah. So yeah. freedom is what I'm looking for. Freedom to fly because yeah. that's what yeah. our people fought for. The the ability to freely move about these streets. Mm -hmm. And there's only so many digital streets I can flew through. <laughs> Amen. I say I hear you. I hear you. I feel the same way. So thank you so so much. Um thank you to everyone that tuned in live. Your comments, um, your love is really appreciated. Tambor Ray, you are a treasure. Thank you so much for taking time out to talk with me today. We'll be back next week. I'm not sure who the guests are. I have to look at the schedule. There's a lot going on. But thank you all for tuning in. I really appreciate you. And we are out because this culture ain't going to make itself. Take care. Thank you.